Hello, my name is Liz Heileman with HIV and Hepatitis.com, and we're here at the 20th Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections in Atlanta to, uh, to learn about some new data about HIV and new for CROI in the past couple years um, is a discussion of Hepatitis C as well, which we'll be focusing on today. And I have with me um, Cami Graham from Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Sherman from the University of Cincinnati, and Dr. Kristen Marks from Cornell. So first, um, would one of you like to sort of summarize some of, the, some of the studies we saw here? We saw some studies of some of the new direct-acting direct antiretroviral agents um, used in people with, with hepatitis C alone, which we call mono-infected, and some data about these new agents um, in combination with pegylated interferon and ribavirin for people with um, both Hepatitis, hepatitis C and HIV we refer to as co-infected. So um, do you want to give us your sort of thoughts about what you heard at the meeting? Well, I will get started with that. Uh, uh, first, I want to emphasize what you said right at the beginning, that uh, more and more hepatitis is becoming uh, an important component of this meeting, and uh, there's clearly an effort and an interest to get out messages about hepatitis to the infectious disease community that traditionally manage patients with HIV infection. But uh, to expand that, there's a tremendous need to have increased numbers of providers to manage the large bolus of patients, uh, both mono-infected and co-infected, that we think we will be seeing across the United States, across the world in the next few years. Uh, at this meeting, I think we have continued to see some important data regarding both extensions of current therapy, how to use treatments that, that we have, the addition of newer direct acting agents to peg interferon ribavirin, as well as the emergence of data. It's been a process now for the last few years of, uh, of the interferon free regimens that uh, combine various medications but without the use of interferon for the effective treatment of hep C. And uh, not only globally can we say that these treatments appear to be better tolerated overall, but uh, they have been associated with decreased duration of therapy and uh, very high rates of sustained viral response, which is the word that has been used historically to really mean the cure of hepatitis C infection. So uh, I think that, that it's worth mentioning a couple of those agents and the data that we've seen at this meeting. We, we saw a couple of studies with cefosfivir, and uh, perhaps one of you might comment on those studies. Right, just, so, just for background, cefosfivir is, uh, is Gilead's um, hepatitis C protease inhibitor. It's formerly known as GS uh, 7997, which is how some people may may know that. So, please. Um, on Monday, we saw uh, the, for the first time the data of its use with a uh, an, another Gilead agent, which now has the name Lodipsevir. I think I said it right. <laughs> and that and would be <laughs> formerly known as uh, GS 5885. Yes, uh, with ribavirin, and in, in the presenter did a nice. Um, contrast of, of the results from the dual therapy, so the cefosfivir with ribavirin alone versus using the triple combination of, of the, the two direct acting antivirals with, with ribavirin. And it, there were small studies, um, but in, it, there was actually two arms. One included um, treatment naive patients, and one included null responders, which is, you know, are the sort of hardest to treat traditionally patients. And which are people who who have tried interferon therapy before, essentially, and then and didn't achieve a cure. Didn't work. And when, when, when those patients were studied in the past with cefosfivir and ribavirin, those patients, uh, for 12 weeks, the treatment had very high relapse rates. They were suppressed on treatment, but relapsed. Right. And, and so the addition of the third agent, with the addition of the third agent, um, we saw much higher SVR rates, actually 100%. Granted, mm -hmm. small numbers of patients, um, I think it was 10 in, in that mm -hmm. arm. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but that was very exciting. And also the treatment naive similarly had 100% SVR4 and, and 12. So um, certainly something we'll all be looking forward to see. What, what that was, that was that one of the most exciting presentations forward. for right. me. Right. The, uh, 
the other study that uh, we saw presented earlier today from Dr. Osanusi at uh, the National Institute of Health was the SPARE-1 trial. Uh, and this study is particularly interesting because it represents uh, a closer representation of the real world of patients that we see. Uh, the NIH uh, set up a phase two study in uh, an inner city population in the Washington, D.C. area and uh, treated patients with cefospivir plus ribavirin using uh, patient a randomization to a lower dose versus a standard weight-based ribavirin dose. And uh, a quarter of the patients had advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. The majority were African American. So this represents the kind of population that again is very real world and is somewhat different than what typically enters the uh, drug registration trial. These were almost all or all people that were being treated for the first time? That is correct. Right. They were okay. treatment naive okay. patients. And uh, the study demonstrated very good results, not the 100% seen in small groups of right. perfect patients, but uh, very high response rates. Mm -hmm. Uh, virtually no adverse events or drug-related side effects seen, and uh, at least some evidence that uh, the higher dose of ribavirin might be needed uh, in this interferon-free regimen. Great. And you mentioned um, one of the other agents is uh, faldaprevir. Did anyone? Well, I, just, I was, I was going to comment. So oh, please. Um, you know, it, it's not going to be clear when we can get rid of interferon in all patients. And so two important studies, Faldaprevir and then um, another new protease inhibitor, uh, Simeprevir, um, were both looked at with pegylated interferon and ribavirin in HIV hepatitis C co-infected uh, patients. And I think one thing that really struck me was the results in these two studies, there were different studies, uh, Simeprevir actually looked at treatment experience patients as well, but the results looked almost identical to what we've seen in the hepatitis hepatitis C mono-infected patients. Mm -hmm. So you're now having people say, we're not really sure HIV has that much impact on responses. Mm -hmm. And compared to when we just had pegylated interferon and ribavirin, you know, with much, much lower uh, cure rates in the co-infected population, I think this is a very transformative um, sort of idea that maybe HIV is not going to be a barrier to cure um, like it was before the direct acting right. antivirals. And I think that the same, something similar was seen with um, bosepravir and telaprevir, which were the first two protease inhibitors, and they, they're not as convenient and not as tolerable as the new ones, but they also had similar response rates, and, and um, if I remember correctly, the, the side effects weren't appreciably greater in co-infected people, which is what what, there's been some concern that that might be the case. If anything, I think the side effects have, have been lower. One of the important things as an HIV provider about the Feldeprevir presentations where they did show the drug interactions with uh, Darunavir, which up till now I haven't been able to um, use with co-infected patients, although Bosepravir arguably you, you could. Um, mm -hmm. Usually I'll do that as part of a study. If if I'm doing that, but the, um, they showed basically that the feldaprevir um, levels are lowered by darunavir, as one might expect. Mm -hmm. and it's great to see some of the companies doing the studies yeah, of these, right. of these drug before interactions they did their before, phase two. before they need to see them. And, that, and, um, and, you know, it didn't appear any difference in response based on the use of that drug, so it's an important and you've mentioned, Dr. Sherman, about, about the, the expected sort of influx of new patients, and, and I know the, the public health authorities have sort of recently recommended that everybody in, in sort of baby boomer age group be, be screened. Can you talk more about why that's important and what you think that will result in? Sure. Um, so for the last decade and a half at least, we've been operating under a paradigm of patients with risk should be screened and uh, the choice of determining who's at risk and, uh, and determining who should be screened has been in the hands of mostly primary care physicians who overall it appears have elected not to screen patients routinely for hepatitis C and uh, uh, 
data in various types of high surveillance areas actually suggests that uh, we're missing or have missed many opportunities that uh, that someplace between 50 and 75 percent of all patients with hep C in the United States have not been tested and don't know that they have hepatitis C. Uh, in the last couple of years, there's been an effort by the CDC to try and identify newer strategies that might help us determine uh, a better way to identify those people. And, uh, and various modeling studies have suggested that, that there is a peak incidence and, or peak prevalence group that uh, exists between those people born in 1945 to 1965, which corresponds to periods of both a high risk in the blood supply for uh, women who receive transfusions and uh, in a, that period of time, and those who experimented or in some cases used for longer term injection drugs. And uh, so the rate of positivity in that cohort is elevated and uh, based upon various models that uh, tell us the cost effectiveness of doing this screening, uh, the CDC has now promulgated uh, a concept that there should be at least once in your life every person be born between, who was born between 1945 and 1965 should be tested for hep C. That will not identify everyone who has hep C, but it will identify something over 800,000 people that, uh, that potentially could then be treated and hopefully with these newer agents taken to cure. Now, there are still many hurdles that remain and, uh, and perhaps Cammie would like to address some of those. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is really important. If society chooses to try to identify these baby boomers, which represent about 75% of who has hepatitis C, the CDC estimates will save 120,000 lives. And that's estimating that not everybody will um, be treated and, you know, it, it, it and, and so, you know, this is an opportunity to really make an impact. But what we're trying to understand is, you know, how do we get that word out? How do we make sure that people understand, you know, that they do need to be treated? How do we increase the capacity of care providers so they have a place to go, you know, to be evaluated, to be treated? So there's a lot of logistics we're going to need to work out. Um, but I think, you know, the most important step was really getting a very clear, simple um, uh, recommendation from the CDC. And they did a nice job at this meeting describing that to us. So going forward, um, I guess you, you sort of started to touch on this, but what are your our hopes for the field in the next in the next maybe five years going forward? I know we're going to start to see some of the um, uh, of the new direct acting agents be approved, perhaps as as early as the, the rest of this year. And um, going forward, we're going to see the interferon free combinations. So, what 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 are your projections? I think Let's start that. Looking I'll at start crystal that. Ball, I'd like to see less toxic, shorter duration, with drug interactions that are manageable and, and well defined um, would be my goal. Was that the answer to the question? <laughs> I'm not sure. That's, that's the question you asked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that actually the next couple of years are going to be tough because we're going to see the, the beginning of this transition to newer drugs and at least in certain settings, clearly identified interferon-free regimens. For example, the genotype 2-3 patients will probably be the first to be approved in an interferon-free regimen. Um, but I, I fear that there will be a belief that that will automatically apply to everybody. Right and it's going to cause actually a great deal of confusion among the community that identifies these patients and the patients themselves. Uh, over the next few years, I think we'll start to see the availability of more interferon-free regimens, but at the same time, the next primary wave is actually going to include treatment 
with interferon for genotype 1 patients. And yes, the treatments will get better. For example, simiprevir will hopefully be coming up for evaluation by the FDA within this upcoming year. But, uh, and, and it's once a day and there's less drug-drug interactions, but it's still with PEG interferon and ribavirin. Right. Uh, we saw some data today on interferon-free regimen with simiprovir and sofosfibir, mm -hmm. and that's really exciting data, but that's, that's still early phase two data, and again, that's gonna be, by the time it gets through phase three trials, another couple of years right. down the road. So uh, if anything, I think the next two years, there will be confusion. Patients who have hep C are gonna need to make sure that they, they have conversations with their healthcare provider. And there's a duty of the healthcare providers to kind of be up on what is happening, what is changing, and what is coming or else we're not gonna be able to properly guide and advise the patients about do this now versus wait another year, uh, go beyond that. And finally, there's still a giant variable in this and that's the cost of these medications. We, the current ones we have are very expensive. The next generation is likely to be expensive, though we don't know anything about pricing at this point. And, uh, we have to decide as a society, are we paying for these cures that, as Dr. Graham said, will save lives, but there has to be a societal will and a societal commitment to do that. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we're out of time. So thank you for, for joining us, and uh, I think we have an exciting period ahead of us in the, in the world of hepatitis C.